me, say crazy faith. Now say it like you're a little crazy. Crazy faith. That's what we're talking about. I'm excited about it. It's, oh man, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to grow your faith, strengthen your resolve, and it's going to give you hope. Oh man, I, I'm already preaching. I was trying to do my introduction now. Come on now. Huh? In case you missed last week, let me catch you up because uh, a few things were, were talked about that uh, I hope you didn't miss. If you didn't get the email, if you didn't follow social media, if you didn't watch online, let me catch you up. Last week uh, was our Vision Sunday. If you missed it, never miss another one because they are insane. Um, but we talked about all that God's going to be doing here at Movement City Church. And one of the big things is that our pastor, also known as my mom and dad, gave a big announcement. An announcement that is very bittersweet that they are going to be transitioning out this year in August as the lead pastors of Movement City Church. And they have been leading our congregation for over 36 years. It's crazy. Uh, but I believe what God is preparing for them is their sweet spot. As my parents uh, have the unique ability to just minister to ministers. They are literally going to be pastoring pastors all around the nation and missionaries all around the world. And I'm telling you, I've seen them in action and that is what they were built to do. And so though it is sad to, to leave for them to take a break from leading the pastor here to go do that, uh, we're excited for what God has for them. And specifically... Um, I, I am honored, and my wife and I, Margie, are super grateful that the leadership here at Movement City has um, elected us to be the representation here in a few weeks as we vote as the new lead pastors of Movement City Church. I know y'all are just clapping for her, but I'll take it. Y'all think, y'all, yeah, y'all don't even know. You, be excited about her. Be thankful that I'm not what I used to be. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> be quiet. My wife on the front row, he's right. Um, no, but we're really grateful to be here, honored to be serving, and uh, just excited about what God is going to do. Also, last week, we mentioned um, this idea of the day of giving on March 6th. This is where this crazy faith comes in. See, we had uh, God interrupt our normal scheduled programming this year, and he said, I want to do something different. And um, it takes an act of crazy faith to step up and tell people that you want to do something you've never done. And that they need to take part in it. And when we came to you last week, we had this idea that we want to reach back into our community, back into our city. From uh, God is beginning to unlock doors that have been locked due to COVID and, and, and racial discrimination and injustice. That, that, that people in our community that have had their hand pushing us away are now welcoming us in. And we want to do so in a huge audacious way. Because we believe that our city is our city. That God has given us ownership and authority over the people in our city. And that when we say we want to be a movement that transforms our city, the reason we call it our city is because you treat things that you own better. Margie doesn't like to ride with me when we're out of town because uh, we get rental cars. And uh, I tell her, don't be gentle, it's a rental. And um, I mean, that's just the truth. I, don't, I hug curbs and I go quick and I don't wash it and yeah. But my car, I treat better. Why? Because it's mine. And God has given us ownership over the city. And so we're going to reach back into the city and do some audacious things. Some things that we haven't done in a long, 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 long time. And we're going to do something we've never done before, which is on March 6th. We're praying and believing that through your generosity and giving, that we're going to raise the single largest offering that Movement City Church has ever given. And it's all going out. None of it's staying here. We're not getting new chairs, new carpet, new, <laughs> new nothing. It's all going out. We're just a conduit to what God wants to do in our city. And we're believing that on March 6th, over $300,000 is going to be raised on that day. Could you go ahead and thank God for that? But I got to be honest. When I told people that's what we're doing, they go, you're crazy. Everybody say, you're crazy. And it kind of feels that way. You're crazy. A hundred-something-year-old church going to raise the biggest offering. You're crazy. And if in a pandemic-filled environment, society, and up in disarray, you're going, what? That's crazy. But what we begin to discover is that sometimes God just inspires a little bit of crazy to add a whole lot of faith. I want to look at somebody in the Bible that I think had some crazy faith. And as you turn to Genesis chapter number 6, let me first unveil or define for you what I consider crazy faith. I... I I'm going to give you the definition of crazy. Before I do, I think we all know what crazy looks like. Everybody in your family, you got somebody that's crazy. Come on now. If you're scratching your head trying to figure out who it is, you're thinking too long because it's you. You know what I'm saying? 
You're like, I don't think we have somebody. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you see him in the mirror, you know. <laughs> It's okay because I'm that person. I'm the crazy one that, that wants to go, you know, jump off the hill or back dive when I've never front dived. You know, I'm the, I'm the guy that's crazy in our family, so I get it. But here's the definition so we get a clear understanding of what is crazy. Crazy is not mentally sound, marked by thought or action with that lack reason, insane sense. I mean, put my picture right beside it, okay? I'm crazy, y'all. But I don't care about Webster's definition of faith because the Bible gives us a much better definition in Hebrews chapter 11, 1. Everybody say, now faith. faith. Now faith is confidence in what, in what we hope for. Everybody say hope. hope. Say faith again. Faith. Now hope. hope. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. And the assurance about what we do not see. That's where the crazy part comes in. If someone walked in this morning and go, Pastor Brennan, did you see that unicorn in the parking lot? I'm like, this dude's crazy. There ain't no unicorn in the parking lot. I don't know what it, He's crazy. Why? Because he's seeing something I don't think exists. And when you tie our crazy to our faith, what we understand is we're not just seeing things that don't exist. We're seeing through God's eyes at things that have not yet become true. And so when we start to express our crazy faith to other people, they go, I don't see that happening. Well, you know what? That's okay, because God does. Oh, I don't see how y'all going to raise that kind of money. I don't need your approval. I just know God's going to do it. Amen. Crazy says, I see the world not as it is, but as how God wants to turn it. I see our community not as broken and disheveled, full of endless hate and violence. I see our city as a, as a hilltop for the rest of our country to see how somebody can love the right way. I see healing and wholeness where brokenness exists. And people without eyesight of crazy faith see, no, I don't see that. That's cool, because I do. And because I do, I'm going to do something about it. Noah, God inspired Noah. He came to him. Now, what you need to know about Noah is Noah is not just a, a regular man. Noah is a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now, we need to get back to this definition. Faith is the confidence in what we what? See, we get that backwards sometimes. Sometimes we think, if I have enough faith, I can hope that tomorrow gets better. But the Bible teaches us that that is absolutely backwards. If I don't have something to hope in, then my faith will be weak. But my faith is built that what God has told me will happen could actually happen. So my hope puts confidence in my faith. In other words, hope activates faith. See, in the church world, even today, sitting in these seats, I don't think you have a faith problem. I think you've lost your hope. I think that what you think of as hope right now is so minuscule in what God is actually capable of that you haven't destroyed your faith. You have shrunk your hope so much you don't need faith for it to actually happen. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in the world that tomorrow is dependent on Brendan alone. I want to live in the world that my future is only possible if God does something crazy. And that's the hope I live in. Without hope, we cannot have faith. And without crazy hope, we can't have crazy faith. This is Noah, Genesis chapter 6. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. And then he goes verse by verse by verse by verse talking about this boat, this ark. He want, This is going to be this cubic long, this cubic's high, this many levels on it, this much storage in it. I mean, he describes this thing to the very last detail, which is a lot. And then this is Noah's response. How you and I should be able to respond but often don't. Noah, after giving this instruction manual for how to build a boat, verse 22, Noah did everything. Say everything. everything. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. He didn't do some of the things. He didn't do half the things and then wait for more instruction. He did everything. everything. Partial obedience is nothing more than disobedience. If God has asked you to do something, don't do it halfway. Don't do it until you get another word. Just do it. Do everything. Noah did everything. Now, you have to understand, 
God is about to flood the earth. He prompts Noah, hey, I'm going to save the world through you. So here is your hope. And then he goes verse by verse by verse, again, describing in detail this boat. You can almost imagine Noah sitting there with a pencil or a chisel and a tablet. I don't know how he took notes, but I'm sure he had some good ones because God was being detailed. And you might think, well, God was being detailed because he didn't want the boat to sink. That might also be true. But I think God was painting a clear picture Because Noah's faith was going to be tested and he needed to know without a shadow of a doubt, this is what I'm building. Because there were people who must have thought Noah was crazy. (laughs) Noah, what you doing? I'm building. What you building? An ark. Okay, okay. Um, What's an ark? (laughs) I don't know, but God told me to build it. You want to help? No? Okay. I'm going to build it then. See, some of y'all also, you think because the chapters just kind of flow real quickly that Noah worked on it a couple months, a couple weeks, a couple years. Uh, Try 120 years he was building this boat without ever seeing a drop of rain. His faith was tested. And what I believe is he kept walking back to the drawing board and making sure, nope, this is what God told me. Oh, right there. He said that I'm going to save humanity and that my family is going to repopulate the earth. Okay, let's go back out and cut some more wood. 120 years. Noah, are you still building that boat? Sure am. How's it going? Good, I guess. It's been 60 years, about halfway done. By the way, what's it for? Oh, the rain's going to come. Rain that we've never seen. Uh Uh-huh. Floods are going to rise. Rise above levels we've ever seen possible. That's right. And you're going to be safe in it, right? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, Moses is crazy. But the interesting thing about crazy faith is it's, it's only crazy until it happens. He finishes it. All of a sudden, these animals start showing up in his backyard. And he's like, y'all know where to go. Doors open, go on in. Don't room next to something that will eat you, you know. (laughs) And all the people in the city that thought he was crazy are starting to go, that's weird. (laughs) What a quinky dink. He was just building. Yeah, it's a coincidence for sure. That's how God works in coincidence. No, bro, God had a plan. And then all of a sudden, could you imagine these jokers just watching all these animals get in, and then the first drop of rain falls. What is that? Did you feel that? I felt that. Did you feel that? I felt that. And then Noah and his family get their suitcases and and board the boat. And the Bible says that they couldn't close the door because it was too big, so God reached down with his own paw and shut that thing. And they were going, we might have misjudged the situation. (laughs) Could you imagine what it was like standing outside the boat going, all right, Noah, um, we were just playing. You got room in there for us. Now, Noah, I'm sure, was godly and honest and all that stuff. I would have been standing on top of the boat going, I'm sorry, I can't hear you from up here. You still call me crazy? What would you say? Because it's only crazy until it happens. In your life, there's some things that God is giving you, some visions for your future and your marriage, your kids and your life and your business and all these things. And everyone around you goes, that's crazy. Put your head down and keep being crazy. Because at some point, I can't wait till they go, dang, you were right. It's only crazy till it happens. What I love about our church is that the ark wasn't the only thing built with crazy faith. But Movement City was too. This church, some of y'all don't know, in 1910, in 1910, Reverend A.P. Collins came home from a revival, a revival service in Los Angeles where God gave him a vision, a dream, a picture of what a church could look like. And God directed him to Fort Worth, Texas. He came from L.A. to Fort Worth in 1910 and got the storefront on Sundays. He rented it out over on 15th Street. And a small contingent of people started meeting. And you have to assume that people came by and go, what are you all doing? We're starting a church. There's already churches in Fort Worth. I know, but God wants us to be different. He started saying things out of that revival. He goes, I think this should be a church of diversity where people of all races and creeds get to gather. I think this is a church that is built for this community so that we can reach out and do things. And everybody goes, man, that is crazy. It'll never last. 
The church began to grow and grow, and new leadership took over, and God began to give more and more vision all the way up until 1986. They hired a little evangelist, a whippersnapper of a dude. <laughs> What's interesting is that he had just been on the, on the field just preaching from church to church, and my mom... My mom had never lived in the city, same city for more than 10 months. And so to think that they were going to settle down and put roots down was crazy. Yet 36 years later, here they still are. They took over a church of about 200 people. My dad had this vision God gave him before he would agree to be pastors of the church. He goes, I want to pastor a missions-giving church. And the board said, well, pastor, that's great and all, but we've got bills to pay. And he goes, I know, but I think if if the tithing principle works in the home, it should also work in the house of God. So every dollar that comes in, we're going to give 10 cents. And they go, Pastor, that's crazy. We are the church. We don't have to give. That's crazy. And he goes, okay, but we're going to do it. And it wasn't easy. It was difficult. Sometimes they had to sit down and write on a pen and paper, man, we got to pay the electric bill, we got to pay the water bill, and let's just make sure we take note because this is how much we owe God. They go, Pastor, are you still doing that? He says, I don't think you understand. Our vision is that we become one of the prominent missions-giving churches in the entire world. I want to give more than we bring in. And they're going, Pastor, that's crazy. And yet here we are 36 years later, and we have given millions, millions, millions of dollars to Africa, to South America, to missionaries all across the world. Because what everybody else said was crazy, he said, yeah, but that's what God has called us to. He had a vision of a church that would do more than anything else, give. And he had two kids, his oldest son and then his favorite. <laughs> hey, buddy. Yeah, I wasn't born bald. I got here. As the church began to grow, dad began to have new visions of what it could happen. He says, I, wanna, I want a new property. We were located over off Trail Lake. And as the church began to grow, we started looking at expanding the church. He told people, I want to pastor a church of over 1,000 people. I want to know that, that we're discipling, training, and sending out more people. And if we're sending out people, God's got to give us a horde of people in. So we started praying about being a larger church, a 1,000-member church. And yet then God gave him a vision. He said, the kingdom of God is bigger than just your church. Which for a pastor is hard to hear. And God said, I want you to give your life to give people, pastors, and money to go plant other churches. And we were growing. We were four or five hundred people deep. We're getting close to hitting that number, which everyone thought was crazy anyways. And as we got close, people go, it might happen, it might happen. And then dad goes, I want to go plant a church. Pastor, that's crazy. If you send out money and you send out people... And you send out pastors, how are we going to survive here? He says, I don't care because this is what God called us to. And 11 years after he became the lead pastor, we planted in 1997 Victory Family Church in Burleson, Texas. But he wasn't done. In 2003, we planted Shepherds Valley Cowboy Church in Alvarado. In 2009, we planted La Casa de Dios right here in our own backyard. In 2011, we planted the Well Church in Willow Park. 2012, Seven City Church in downtown Fort Worth. 2016, we planted Brownstone Church in Weatherford. And for the first time ever, just a year ago, we planted Godly, who is not just a church, but it's our church, Movement City Godly in Godly, Texas. And every time that we went to the board or we went to the leadership, everyone had this idea like, okay, it could happen, but it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy to think of a healthy church giving out people. It's kind of a crazy for a healthy church to give out pastors and money to go to places that it's never coming back to. But as we sent people out, we said, go with God and go to the places that we'll never reach, to the people we'll never talk to and tell them about the love of Jesus. And every single one of those churches are still growing and alive and doing incredible things. Because our pastor saw the vision of God as bigger than just one building and one church. But through it all, we can celebrate and high five now. But back then, people thought we were crazy. And now, 36 years later, he's still crazy. I'll be honest, if after 36 years God says, hey, Brendan, it's time to move on, we're going to have multiple discussions. I know that's not how it happened with my dad. 
God began to inspire my dad that it was time to transition out of leadership here at the church. And the crazy part is not that he's transitioning, but this is the healthiest, most excited moment of our church's history. We've never been more excited of the team that God has given us. We've never been more excited about the people who are showing up every single weekend to worship with the, with the, the place, the, the, where the building's at, where our finances are at. It is like we are set to explode, and Dad goes, okay, God told me to leave. What? No, Dad, taking a few more years, honestly, I, I'm like, Dad, I want, I want you to pastor the biggest, best church. And he goes, no, 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 God says it's for you. Now they have crazy faith again to believe this young whippersnapper could do something that I watched my dad fight for every single day of his life. To not just grow a church in number, but to grow it and grow a movement. It's crazy until it happened. But I'm not just here to talk about a, a boat being built or a church being built. I'm telling you, you for your life, for your marriage, for your kids, you've got to have some crazy faith inside of you. You've got to have something inside of you that says it doesn't matter, that it doesn't make sense, or that no one else can see it. God told me that I will live in a marriage that honors him, not that's stuck in fighting and misery. The problem is we've lost sight of the picture that God has given us, and we've settled for whatever is easy. Hope is not built on what I can accomplish. Hope is built that God has something better than I'm currently in. And when you lose your hope, you won't have faith. There's people in here right now, there's, there's somebody in here right now that you're saying, you know, I used to have this beautiful picture, this, this white picket fence fairy tale that my, my, my spouse and I would wake up in the morning, we'd read the Bible together, we'd go to bed and pray together, we'd worship together. That was your hope. That was the dream that God had given you, something that he painted so clearly so that you could have crazy faith to believe in it. But because of the circumstances of your life and the things going on, you have settled for just an okay marriage. You've settled for the fact that, well, we haven't divorced yet. There's some people in here that you or someone you love has been battling issues of disease and, and health issues and where you used to believe in the first few months that, oh, I know God's going to heal me. I know that God's going to heal my wife. I know that God's going to heal us. He's our healer. He's our healer. When it stretches out to 18 months, you're going, I just, I'll settle for a day with less pain. When you lose your hope, you begin to settle. And as a church and as your pastor, I don't want to settle for anything more than what God has for me. I don't want you to settle in your business just saying, I'll just keep doing my thing and I'll keep my head down. No, maybe God has inspired you with a heart for, like an entrepreneur and you're supposed to go out there and dig more. But every time you pitch a business idea to somebody, they go, that's crazy. It's, yeah, it's crazy until it happens. There's somebody in here that you need to grab hope by the horns and say, I need, to, I need to increase my faith. I've been settling for comfortable and easy. I've been settling for something less than what God wants for me. I, 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 God, would you show me that picture of what you have for me again? Because the Bible says, Jeremiah 29, 11, that God knows the plans he has for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. Hope. See, sometimes we settle for our plans instead of the plans that God created us for. We settle into what is comfortable and easy and, and in our mind what we could actually accomplish. I don't want to live a life knowing that Brendan could accomplish everything I've done. But there needs to be a piece of my life that goes, except for God, Brendan couldn't have done that. If not for God, Movement City Church couldn't have done that. If not for God, that marriage would be dead. If not for God, those kids would be abandoned. If not for God, I need a lot of my life to have if not for God inside of it. But some of us, we need to get our hope back. You need to stop believing the lie of the enemy that this is as good as it gets. Just strap in, buckle up, and just live your life out with a fake smile and a hopeless heart. Because for, imagine for me, imagine with me for a second, if God hadn't given up on that dream 
that he promised you. For Noah, it took 120 years. That's a long time. Some of us have been playing, praying for 120 days, and we're like, well, I guess it ain't going to happen. No. Have hope. Have hope, Mom. That that son or that grandchild that has lost his way, they used to pray that they'd be sitting next to you in a church service, and now you just pray that they'd survive another day. Your, your hope has shrunk so much that you're no longer praying for a miracle. You're just hoping they survive. That's not God's plan for that baby. What if? What if in a few weeks, a few months, you get a phone call, and you're not dismissing or hiding that phone, worried that, oh, they're going to ask for more money. Oh, they got into trouble again. But you answer that phone call with hope inside of you, believing maybe this is the call. What if you were to answer and they go, hey, it's been a really rough week. Would you mind if I came to church with you? See, some of you, you can't even think that way because you've been settling for something less for so long. Imagine if in six months from now you, you look over in bed and you're not distracted by the TV or your phone and you're actually happy in the partnership that God created for you with your spouse. That fighting wasn't a constant battle and trying to just not say divorce, you don't have to hold your tongue, but you actually get to look over at someone and know that they love you unconditionally, that you're in this together Imagine for a second if you weren't just going from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to lessen the pain, but in a moment God touches you and the great physician brings wholeness into your body that you thought was a forgotten dream. That's the hope we have to walk away with is that no matter what my circumstances, no matter what I feel, no matter what I see, I'm crazy enough in my faith to believe that God can still restore my marriage. I'm crazy enough in my faith that when all my family says it's over and forgotten, I will stay on the hope that God will fix my kid. I'm crazy enough that though you can't see it, I'm looking at it through God's eyes, and I know he's going to heal my body. I know it's been 18 months. It's been 18 years, and cancer is coming back, but I'm going to stand in wholeness one day. My faith will be crazy because my hope is huge. You have to have something to hope for. And faith isn't just belief. Faith is moving when you don't know where you're going. Faith is trusting to take a step when you don't know if you're going to fall. Scripture tells us faith without works is dead. I don't want to be the person that says, God, I believe you. Just show me. God, I'll, believe, I'll take a step as soon as you light my path. No, we got to be willing to take steps of faith when we don't see how it's going to work out. we got to start building the boat when we don't see rain. Because God said so. we got to have some crazy faith. I know for some of you, you're standing on a different side of faith than I am. For some of you, you came in today and you, you honestly thought to yourself, man, I... I'm going to give this church thing another try. I'm going to give this faith thing another try. Some of you, man, when you looked at that pledge card this morning, you go, oh, here we go again. Another church just wants my money. Dude, I get it. I totally get it. But I, I want you to understand, we're not asking you to give what we want you to give. We're asking you to give what God wants you to give. We're asking you to be obedient like Noah did take part in the miracle that God was preparing. And I get it, some of you, you're a little bit further down the, the baby steps of faith, and I've been there, but I want to tell you, 
when you partner with God, he does amazing things. In 2013, December 27th, 2013, Margie and I welcomed little Willow on the front row into our life. And we thought we were prepared, as most parents do. <laughs> we thought we were prepared and we were ready, and I saved money so that Margie could stay home from work for a little bit longer. And I was really excited because she was born on December 27th, 2013, and not January 1st of 2014. I got that tax benefit from the year before. <laughs> what? Y'all think I'm crazy. That's 100. I was stoked. And Margie was heading back to work, and I had just completed our taxes, and I was, we were getting money back. I remember the amount, $3,300, and I thought, we can make it. I was stoked. I was so excited to see that number come in, because I was like, man, God is faithful. He's so good. Man, I thank you, and God, and, and I remember, I was just, I was thanking God. I really was, I felt prompted to, like, I saw the money, and I started thinking about all the things we can do with it, these dope little, like, uh, backpacks I can put Willow in and all this other stuff. I think it's so dumb. But uh, honestly, I was just like, this is like seven diapers. I can buy, like, seven diapers with $3,000. Like, it was crazy. But I remember this prompting. It was kind of this Noah moment in my heart where I felt like God, number one, was saying, you're welcome. But then the secondary thought was, do you trust me? And anytime God says that to me, I always know something is coming. 3000 I'm looking at the, on my computer, $3,300 coming in. God said, if you trust me, trust me with that. And I felt prompted of the Holy Spirit that Margie and I were to reverse tithe on that money, meaning we could keep 10% and we were supposed to give the church 90. And I'm sitting here going, God, I had just like convinced myself I should tithe at all off this money, much less. <laughs> like I was thinking, I think this was my money anyways. The IRS was borrowing. Like I'm sure I already tithed off of it. <laughs> oh, don't act like you don't do that. <laughs> I got $20 off the ground. Ooh, this is a blessing. I don't need to tithe off that. No. I was like, God, I just convinced myself to tithe, and now you're trying to get me to reverse tithe? And so I went to my sounding board, who was my wife. And I've done this multiple times in our marriage, and I'm currently looking and uh, interviewing for new sounding boards because she never does what I want her to do. I went to my wife, and I said, sweetheart, we got $3,000, $3,300 coming back from the IRS. And she was like, yes. I was like, I know. But God... You know how he does. <laughs> um, I thought I said I felt prompted because Willow came. She's such an incredible piece of our family. We're so grateful for it. I feel like God wants us to sow a seed of gratitude. And I think we're supposed to give this money away. Three thousand dollars. We're supposed to write a check. And I didn't put the hard emotional sell like I am now. Like I was very blunt, very to the point. Like almost all great. He wants us to give three thousand dollars away. And she goes, is that what he said? I go, that's what I think he said. What do you think? And once again, she failed me. She goes, I guess we got to do it then. I'm like, that gummit. Come on, man. <laughs> and of course, as God does, I'm sitting in a meeting the next week, and Jack Hunt, who is our Weatherford pastor, they had bought land, and they were about to have Easter service, and he wanted to rent a tent and inflatables and chairs and all this stuff for that. But he said, but I just don't think we have the money. And I'm like, here we go. I felt this poke in my side. I said, hey, Jack, how much are you needing to raise? I knew how much you needed to raise because that's how God works. And he goes, well, I got the bid in. It's like $2,988. I go, that sounds about right. And I walk back. And I get home and I go, Margie, here's what we got to do. I think we're supposed to give this money to Jack. And she goes, that sounds about right. So we're sitting at our kitchen table at our dinner table, and I'm writing out a check that I have never written for this type of money. Ever, ever. Like, we got all the tax breaks on our first home that was a foreclosure. Like, it was the largest check. We only traded cars down. We didn't buy nice things. We couldn't afford it. So $3,000 looked like all the money we had. And we prayed over it right there at the kitchen table. And I told her in that moment, babe, this is a lot of money. I'm so excited that we're being obedient to do this. But I want you to know 
though this $3,000 is crazy right now. When I was a teenager, God gave me a dream that one day I want to be able to give $10,000 away. And it's not because I'm rich. It's because God can trust me. I want to be able to give $10,000. And she looked back at me. She goes, well, that's going to be a long time from now. I go, yeah, it probably is. I don't care if it's when I'm 50, 60, 90, we're going to do it. And she goes, I'm with you. And we walked in and I handed that check to Jack. And it took a little while for me to let go of it. <laughs> but I did. Six months fast forward. It's a struggle. Margie went back to work every day. She was dropping our little baby off with a daycare professional. And she was picking him up. And it just felt like, it felt like we were missing time. And we knew both going into our marriage because what if God has called us to, I wasn't going to be making a lot of money. And for us to be able to live, she was going to have to work. But it felt like we were just giving up time with our child every time she dropped her off. And she was crying every morning. She was crying at night. She, and at the heart of a father, I was breaking. I want to be the provider for my family. I want to make sure that she can have what she needs. And so I walked this auditorium every single day and I prayed, God, could you do something? My mind went back to sitting at that kitchen table with a $3,000 check going, dude, I really wish I had that now. Man, if I had that $3,000 right now, I would just tell Margie to quit. I would say, go, just stay home. I'll sell blood. I, I had hair back then. I'll sell that, whatever I need to. As a provider, I felt like it was all on my shoulders, but I prayed to God every single day, God, would you make a way? I started, I went to a, a roofing company, and I just said, hey, can I, can I sell roofs for you when I'm not working? So at 4 o'clock, I, I left the church, and I'd get in my car, I'd put on a different shirt, and I'd start knocking doors. And I thought I'd be good salesman because I do this, I communicate well. Turns out, I don't take rejection well. <laughs> every no tore me to the core. They didn't want roofs. They didn't want me. So it wasn't going well. But I was doing everything I could. I remember walking this auditorium and just saying, God, I'm tired of seeing my wife hurt. If you're not going to do something about this, would you just take our desire away? Have you ever prayed that, God, I want this so bad, but if you're not going to move, would you just remove that want from me? Would you remove that desire? If it's not you, God, would you just remove it? Because I'm tired of seeing my wife cry. I'm tired of feeling like we're abandoned. I'm tired of this, God. I can't do it. And I kept going back to that $3,000 we gave away. And I'm like, God, why would you take that from us? I could really use that right now. We pray and we cry and we sit up at night and we try to crunch all the numbers. And I got to the point one Saturday night, I said, just quit. Quit, stay home. I don't care how it works. If they take the house, if they take the car, whatever is going to happen, I can't have you like this anymore. Just quit. And then my, her being the sounding board finally goes, no, I'm not going to quit. And I'm like, come on, man. But we'd walk into church on Sunday morning. It wasn't that we were hiding our pain. We just refused to allow our current situation to keep us from engaging with God. And we would stand on the front row. And sometimes you raise your hands because you want to. And sometimes it just feels like the right thing to do. Sometimes you close your eyes because you're being intimate with God. Sometimes you're closing your eyes out of frustration. I don't know what was happening, but that Sunday we just began to worship. And we'd given it to God, but it didn't look like he was doing anything with it. And I kept looking back at that, thinking back at that $3,000 crazy faith moment going, God, why did you do that? Why'd you take this? We're struggling. But we worship. After service, a couple that we, we knew called us over. And honestly, I thought they were going to pray for us. I thought that they could see that we were hurting and they just wanted to pray for us. And we had little Willow there and we set her down in her basket and they just started telling us how much they love her and love us. And they had heard about some of the struggles that we were having. And they said, we want to do something. And again, I thought a prayer was about to come. And he reached into his pocket and handed me an envelope. And it had his signature on it and their family, they'd all signed it. It said they prayed together over it. And I'll be honest, I didn't care what was in the envelope. I knew that God had done something. That's all I needed was just somebody else to feel like, hey, I want to help. 
And I'll be honest that we hugged and we cried. But it was that awkward moment where I couldn't look at the envelope because I didn't want them to see me react to it. <laughs> but again, I'm walking back to my office and I'm going, I don't care if there's $10 in here. I don't care if there's $100 in here. This is God saying, I got you, so we're going to take care of it. So I get back to the office and just nonchalantly open up this thing. And it was a check. It was made out to Margie and I at the memo line. It said, it said for Willow's mommy to stay home with him. And I just started crying. Then I looked up at the check. And I looked at it again. And then I looked at it three, four, five times, and I, I wiped my eyes. So I'm like, this isn't real. And I'm going to say this. It's not about the amount, but gum, God. <laughs> I was holding a check made out to me and my wife for $110,000. Which might be like, oh, that's great, that's cool. No, 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 it was unique because that, when you did the math, that was exactly three years of Margie's salary, which our heart was we want to be with Willow until she starts school at three. And as God's like, no, no, I will provide exactly what you need. And then he gave us favor with that money that it stretched out that when Waverly came along, we got to do the same thing. We just extended it because we began to steward his money well. But the best part about it was going home that night sitting down and pulling out the checkbook and writing that check for $11,000. The tithe, because this isn't the moment to be stingy with God. <laughs> and I prayed over and I looked up at Martin. She goes, I know. I still said it, though. I said, I told you I was going to give $10,000 away. And it's not about the money, it's about the trust that God had for us with the money because we took a step of faith, a crazy step. And some of you today, God's going to challenge you to do something bigger than you've ever done before. And it sounds crazy to you, but you don't know what's coming. And God might be challenging your faith right now so that he can give you the blessing when you need it. For us, it was so much more than a check. Because I knew looking across the table with my wife, we're never going to have to make another decision based on money. We're never going to have to look at our finances and say, should we stay at the church? We're never going to have to look somewhere else and go, God, I don't know how we're going to make it. We're never going to struggle because God provided because we were crazy in our faith. And i got to be honest, I, giving away that check just felt like, God, what more can you do? And I'm not telling you to put yourself in my position. Oh, if you give 3,000 this offering, 100's coming to you. No, what I'm telling you is that our church is just like that moment. We're asking for $300,000, but what God has put on our heart is that every year we're a million dollar giving church. So this is just the first step of what God is wanting to do. If we will be faithful in doing the day of giving right and reaching out into our city and using this money wise, who knows what God can do inside of us. But he's not just going to sprinkle money out of the air. He's going to do it through you and I taking crazy steps of faith to make it happen. So for Margie and I, I told her, I want to own a percent of this miracle. We're giving $3,000. That's our magic number, I guess, now. We're giving $3,000, and I'm telling you this, I'm not giving $3,000 expecting a new, another check. I'm giving $3,000 because if he never did another thing for me, much less give me that money, he's done more than I could ever ask, dream, or imagine. And why I'm giving $3,000 is because it still hurts. $3,000 ain't easy. I don't have it sitting in a bank. That's what God asked. I'm not asking you to give $3,000. I'm asking you to be obedient to what God asked you to give. Because when we as a community, when we as a movement, will just be obedient to the level God is asking us, he will do the rest. I'm going to ask you to grab this from your seat right now and hold it. It takes a crazy act of faith sometimes to write that number down. 
takes crazy faith for us. Last week when I walked in the superintendent of Godly's office and began to ask him for land for our church, it takes crazy faith to walk into the principal's office at Southwest High School and say, we want to, be a, we want to help complete your campus by, by being there day in and day out. It takes a crazy act of faith to, to partner with organizations like Metro Ministries and these other people and believe that we can do more than we've ever done before. It's crazy until it happens. And today, I'm not trying to twist your arm. I'm really not. I'm trying to put you in a position where you can be obedient so God can be faithful. All across this place, would you bow your head and close your eyes? I'm going to ask you to, to ask this question to God. God, what are you saying to me? What are you asking of me? The only thing I know is that if you're sitting right now and this number seems feasible or easy, ask again. But what I believe is not just the generosity of, and the generosity of our people, I believe in the generosity of God. That when we partner with him with what we can do, he does what we can't. And it's not always in money coming back. I'm not saying you're going to get a check in the mail. But when God can trust you, he can bless you. Heavenly Father, I pray over these people. God, that you would do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask dream or imagine. God, I don't pray that on this day of the giving that we just make it, God, but I pray that we do so with a grateful heart, realizing that we're partnering with a great God. God, I think, thank you that every single person in attendance today is going to be able to share that same similar testimony that Margie and I get to share of your faithfulness that, that amazes us. God, I thank you that you've always cared for us and always taken care of us. So God, I pray that everybody in this room will hear from you just like Noah did. And they will be obedient to everything you ask so that we can be in a position to be blessed by you. I'd like for you to take 10 seconds with your eyes closed, with your head bowed, once again, ask God, God, what are you asking of me?